Good morning. My name is Todd, and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the fourth quarter 2023 Discover Financial Services Earnings Conference Call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question at that time, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you should need operator assistance, please press star 0. Thank you. I will now turn the call over to Mr. Eric Wasserstrom, Senior Vice President of Corporate Strategy and Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you, and welcome to this morning's call. I'll begin on slide two of our earnings presentation, which you can find in the financial section of our Investor Relations website, investorrelations.discover.com. Our discussion today contains certain forward-looking statements that are subject to risks and uncertainties that may cause actual results to differ materially. Please refer to our notices regarding forward-looking statements that appear in our fourth quarter 2023 earnings press release and presentation. Our call today will include remarks from our interim CEO, John Owen, and John Green, our Chief Financial Officer. After we conclude our formal comments, there will be time for a question and answer session. During the Q&A session, we request that you ask one question followed by one follow-up question. After your follow-up question, please return to the queue. Now it's my pleasure to turn the call over to John. Thank you, Eric, and thanks to our listeners for joining today's call. 2023 was a year of significant change for Discover, and we believe the actions we've taken position the company to continue driving strong, long-term performance. When I stepped into the interim CEO role, I had three priorities. My top priority was to advance our culture of compliance, and we have made meaningful strides in our corporate governance and risk management capabilities. That said, this is a journey that will take time and continued investments over the coming years to further enhance our compliance and risk management capabilities. My second priority is to continue delivering a great customer experience at every touch point, which we do by providing our customers with award-winning service and products. I'd like to thank our 20,000 employees for delivering a great customer experience to help our customers achieve a brighter financial future. In 2023, we were recognized for the first time as one of Fortune 100's best companies to work for. This award adds to our accolade for working parents, women, people with disabilities, and members of the LGBTQ plus community, and we're proud to be an inclusive workplace. My third priority is to sustain our strong financial performance. We reported net income of $2.9 billion for full year 2023 and earnings per share of $11.26. This makes 2023 the third best year for EPS performance in our history. In delivering these results, we achieved several important milestones. We exceeded $100 billion in card receivables, grew deposits by 21% year over year, successfully launched our cash back debit account on a national scale, and we announced our intent to exit the private student lending business. On December the 11th, we announced a new leadership, and we're excited to have Michael Rhodes joining us for our incoming Chief Executive Officer. Michael is an experienced leader with a deep background in the financial services industry. He has managed all aspects of a consumer banking business with deep experience in the credit card space, payments, online and mobile banking, and served as group head of innovation and technology. His appointment marks the conclusion of a rigorous search process and we look forward to Michael's arrival. When Michael arrives, I will return to my prior role on Discover's Board of Directors. In conclusion, I'm proud of the progress we made in 2023. Our integrated digital banking model, resilient financial performance, and maturing risk management and compliance capabilities position Discover well for 2024 and beyond. With that, I'll now turn the call over to John Green, who will review our fourth quarter 2023 financial results in more detail and provide some perspective on 2024. Thank you, John, and good morning, everyone. I'll start with our summary financial results on slide four. In the quarter, we reported net income of $388 million, down from just over $1 billion in the prior year quarter. There are three broad trends to call out. First, we grew revenue 13%, reflecting 15% loan growth, partially offset by modest NIM compression. Second, provision <clears throat> expense grew by $1 billion. 
Charge-offs increased but landed at the low end of our expected range. Strong loan growth and higher delinquency drove the increase to our reserve balance. Finally, expenses increased 19% year over year reflecting investments in compliance and risk management, a reserve for customer remediation, and higher marketing expense to support our national cash back debit campaign. We'll get into the details of these topics on the following pages. Turning to slide five, our net interest margin ended the quarter at 10.98%, down 29 basis points from the prior year and up three basis points sequentially. The decline from the prior year quarter was driven by higher funding costs and higher interest charge-offs, which were partially offset by higher prime rates and increases in revolving balances. For the full year, net interest margin was 11.07%, up three basis points from the prior year. This margin performance reflects the improvement in our funding mix over the past several years and a reduced level of balance transfer and promotional balances as we tightened underwriting. Receivable growth remained <coughs> robust. CARD increased 13% year over year due to contributions from the prior year new account growth and a lower payment rate. The payment rate declined about 110 basis points from the sequential quarter and is now 100 basis points above 2019 levels. Overall, new account growth declined 9% as a result of credit actions. Sales were up 3% compared to the prior year quarter. Personal loans were up 23%, driven by continued strength in originations and lower payment rate versus the prior year. Student loans were flat year over year. As we prepare for a potential sale of this portfolio, we will cease accepting applications for new loans on February 1st. Our deposit business delivered outstanding performance in a challenging year. Average deposits were up 21% year over year and 4% sequentially. Our direct-to-consumer balances grew $3 billion in the period and $14 billion in the year. Looking at other revenue on slide six, non-interest income increased $74 million, or 11%. This was primarily driven by an increase in loan fee income, higher <coughs> transaction processing revenue from our Pulse business, and higher net discount and interchange revenue. Our rewards rate was 137 basis points in the period and 140 basis points for the full year 2023, a decrease of one basis point on a full year basis. The decline reflects lower cash back match from slowing new account growth and our active management of our 5% categories. Moving to expenses on slide seven, <clears throat> total operating expenses were up $280 million or 19% year over year, and up 22% from the prior quarter. Looking at our major expense categories, compensation costs increased $73 million, or 13% from higher headcount. Marketing expenses increased $59 million, or 19%. Professional fees were up driven by continued investment in compliance and risk management capabilities, while other expense reflects a reserve for customer remediation. Moving to credit performance on slide eight. Total <coughs> net charge-offs were 4.11%, 198 basis points higher than the prior year, and up 59 basis points from the prior quarter. In card, as anticipated, delinquency formation is slowing as more recent vintages season. We added a slide detailing some of the drivers of our credit performance in the appendix to the earnings presentation. Turning to the allowance for credit losses on slide nine. This quarter, we increased our reserves by $618 million and our reserve rate increased by 17 basis points to just over 7.2%. The increase in reserves was driven by receivable growth and higher near-term loss content from higher delinquencies. Under Cecil, reserve levels increase as you approach peak losses. We expect our losses to rise through the mid-year and then plateau through the back half with some seasonal variation. In terms of our macroeconomic outlook, our view of unemployment 
was relatively unchanged while household net worth projections increased slightly. These changes provided a small benefit to reserves. Looking at slide 10, our common equity tier one for the period was 11.3%. The sequential decline of 30 basis points was driven largely by asset growth. We declared a quarterly cash dividend of 70 cents per share of common stock. Concluding on slide 11 with our perspectives on 2024, these exclude the impact of a potential student loan portfolio sale. We expect end of period loan growth to be relatively flat, while average loan growth will be up modestly year over year. We expect full year net interest margin to be 10.5 to 10.8 percent. We're currently anticipating four rate cuts of 25 basis points in 2024. This is two more rate cuts than in our forecast in December. Each cut reduces NIM by approximately five basis points subject to a deposit beta. We expect total operating expenses to increase by a mid single digit percent. This contemplates our expectation for compliance related costs to be approximately $500 million this year. Total expenses may increase if incremental resources or remediation is required. We expect net charge offs in the range of 4.9 to 5.3%. <clears throat> Finally, regarding capital return, we will participate in this year's CCARS process and believe the results should help inform our view of capital management for 2024. Importantly, our capital management priorities have not changed and remain centered on supporting organic growth and returning capital to shareholders. To summarize, we continue to generate solid financial results. For 2024, we will continue to advance our compliance and risk management capabilities and invest in <coughs> actions that drive sustainable long-term value creation. With that, I'll turn the call back to our operator to open the line for Q&A. At this time, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you wish to remove yourself from the queue, you may do so by pressing star 2. We remind you to please pick up your handset for optimal sound quality. Again, that's star 1 to ask a question. Our first question will come from Rick Shane with J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Good morning, everybody, and thanks for taking my question. Um, the Excuse me, I'm not I'm a little under the weather today, so I apologize. The loan growth expectations, is that organic loan growth or is that net of the uh, portfolio sale of the student loans? Hey, Rick, uh, John, John Green here. Uh, that is organic loan growth. So all of, the, all of the guidance excluded the impact of a potential student loan asset sale. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Our next question will come from Moshe Orenbuck with TD Cowan. Great, thanks. John, maybe just to follow up uh, on Rick's question, I mean, given the strong growth that you're currently seeing in the personal loan business and, you know, the fact that you're still adding accounts, albeit at a lower level in the credit card business, uh, you did mention, you know, kind of lower, you know, balance transfers, but is, is there something else going on? Can you talk about, you know, kind of deconstruct that loan growth expectation for us a little bit? Uh, sure, sure, sure. Thanks, Moshe. So uh, the, the, the bonus of loan growth, sales, new account generation, payment rate trends. And so what, what we're anticipating for sales, given, uh, given the slowdown through, um, through 2023 in terms of sales, uh, although we did, did have a pretty strong holiday season, uh, is that uh, sales will be relatively flat year over year. Uh, new account generation relative to uh, last year, certainly down, but overall positive um, new account growth. And uh, payment rate, you know, what, what we've tried to do here is um, kind of de-risk the forecast. So we assume that 100 basis points of payment rate that's elevated versus 2019 will remain elevated. So those those three components you know, reflect, um, 
you know, end up coming in and, and reflecting on our projections. Now, you know, loan growth could actually come in higher if uh, if payment rate continues to decline. But overall, you know, our basis for guidance, loan growth, net interest margin, and charge-offs was to to give a range and then also um, be relatively conservative in terms of the expectations on those ranges. Great, thanks. And maybe just as a follow-up, uh, as a, on on the credit side, I mean, you, you know, you did talk, uh, you know, did talk a month ago, and then mentioned again today that you expect kind of losses to peak around the middle of the year. Um, how do we think about the performance after that peak? I mean, you said kind of flattish. Um, you know, wh what's what's driving that? Why isn't that something that improves? And how do we think about reserving in that context? Uh, sure. Yeah, so, so there's a couple different components that are driving that. So if you go back in time, um, we, we had about two years of, of unusually low um, charge-offs and delinquencies, so from the pandemic. And, you know, that process of normalization typically will, will take about the same amount of time, two years. The, um, the vintages, 21 and 22, are seasoning, and that's why we expect it to plateau. The 23 vintage actually was relatively large, but uh, you know, too early to call whether it's going to outperform our expectations. But certainly, um, a, a highly profitable vintage from um, from our, our vantage point today. So what what you're actually just seeing is a period of normalization. You know, my expectation is that uh, you know charge-offs will um, plateau, and then and beginning in 25, I, I would expect those to step down. Now, uh, you, you will know from this past year and the prior year, what we've tried to do in, in terms of the guidance is be conservative um, in terms of the range. And, and throughout 2023, we tightened, we tightened the range and actually came in at the low end. So, you know, my hope is that we'll be able to do the same thing in uh, 2024. Great, thanks. Thank you. Our next question will come from Ryan Nash with Goldman Sachs. Hey, good morning, everyone. John, maybe to dig a little bit deeper on some of the commentary you gave regarding uh, loan growth, maybe just focusing on the account growth. Look, the, the market clearly thinks there's a better chance of a soft landing right now. We're seeing peers who are talking about you know, mid to high single digit growth. and I'm just curious on the account growth, is this more just conservative underwriting? Are you trying to make sure that you make more progress on risk governance and compliance before you increase growth? Maybe just a little bit more color on why you're seeing such a slowdown in terms of the account growth relative to the last few years. Yeah, th thanks, Ryan. So, you know, our approach in, uh, in 23 uh, and then early into 24, was that we we took a look at underwriting and performance of of um, what I'll say buckets within our underwriting box, and um, and essentially tightened and we tightened throughout 2023. You know what uh, what you're seeing here in terms of uh, account growth, at least projections today, is us um, getting back to 2018 and 19 levels as we continue to watch the 22 and 23 vintage perform. And, you know, six months from now, we, we may end up uh, stepping in a little bit more aggressively. But what we wanted to do uh, certainly was let uh, uh, kind of get further confirmation that the delinquency trends that uh, we have seen in terms of slowing rate of delinquency formation continue to persist and that the, the charge-offs uh, the forecasted um, come in at or better than than our expectations. If those two factors are at play, you know there will be an opportunity to be more aggressive in terms of new account growth. Got it. And maybe as my follow up, can you maybe help us understand uh, where you stand with the student loan sale and how would you foresee that impacting the outlook as well as capital return over the next you know four to six quarters? Thank you. 
Yeah, thanks, Ryan. So, uh, you know, good news. So it, it is actually progressing to schedule. So, a uh, matter of fact, uh, uh, last evening uh, we signed a uh, servicing agreement with Nelnet to uh, become the servicer of this portfolio. So, so that was um, great news. Uh, it was a competitive process, and uh, certainly Nelnet showed that there's a commitment to continue to um, dedicate resources and service that portfolio at a high level. The, um, the next step will be, be to continue the servicing migration activities. We expect those activities will take uh, around six months. Uh, we're, you know, conservatively, it may, may take a, a month or two longer. And then uh, uh, as, we're, as we're doing that, our, our advisor will um, begin to market the portfolio. So, you know, our expectations are that, you know, it will it will sell in uh, in the second half. Um, and, you know, the implications for the for the business are as follows. So, there's 9.5 billion dollars of receivables. You know, that that equates to you know, uh, risk weighted assets of about 10.8 billion. Um, we expect uh, that that will be uh, that the exit of that will be have a positive impact on net interest margin uh, by somewhere between 10 and uh, 20 bips on a full year basis. Uh, charge off rate uh, could uh, could tick up mildly, so so under five bips. And uh, as of 1231, we had 858 million dollars of uh, of reserves. So, uh, you know, with a successful exit, uh, you know, the, those reserves will, will drop. And, uh, and, you know, the sale price, you know, the, the market will determine that, but, you know, we expect it to, to go above par. Thank you for all the color. Thank you. Our next question will come from Mahir Bhatia with Bank of America. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you for taking my question. Um, I wanted to start with uh, loan growth also, and I just want to go back to the building blocks a little bit. I think you essentially said in terms of the building blocks, you're expecting payments rates to be elevated, at, uh, like flat to stay at this elevated level, and sales to be flat. You're also adding accounts. So I'm just like trying to understand, like, I guess, what's the bad guy? Like, how, do, how does loan growth stay flat given this year, you know, you had 15%. And just trying to understand, like, like there, there's some piece I'm missing, I feel like, and I'm just trying to understand that. Thank you. Uh, yes. So l l let me try to give a little bit of color that uh, hopefully um, gets folks comfortable with, you know, our, our view of loan growth today. So in 2023, you know, really, really strong loan growth. Um, you know, much of that was was driven both by new account growth, um, but also a slowing payment rate. That payment rate, in, in our assumptions, um, is holding flat, and and as a result, what we what we expect to see is the 2023 vintage will begin to um, uh, kind of build in terms of assets, but. There, there's likely going to be some impact from sales, and then also as as we cycle through the 2022 vintage, you know we're not expecting significant new balance builds from that vintage. Now maybe there will be, uh, but um, overall, um, what we've tried to do here is reflect our view of our underwriting box today, not not um, not reflect any potential openings of our underwriting box in, in the later part of 2023. And, um, you know, if we out deliver on loan growth, uh, that'll, that'll be fantastic. The other, the other element that um, uh, has come into play here is, is we pulled back on balance transfers and promotional balances in, in the second part of 2023. Um, you know, our, we don't anticipate uh, significantly increasing that level of balance transfer or promotional balances. Now, 
uh, if we do, that'll certainly be accretive to loan growth as well. So what um, what you're hearing in the guidance is that, you know, our expectation is that, uh, you know, there's an opportunity to deliver better, but certainly um, we, um, we've positioned both the guidance and the business to be conservative, at least for the next quarter or two. Got it. And then um, I wanted to go back to the expenses and the reserve for customer remediation that you mentioned uh, that you took this quarter. Can you just provide some more color on that? Like, is that related to the merchant mispricing issue? How much was the reserve this quarter? Where does that leave the reserve overall? I think you were at 365 million in 2Q. I'm just trying to understand, has the estimate for the cost related to that issue changed? I think you also mentioned it could be higher, expenses could be higher in 24 if you need to take more reserves there. Like, where are we with that investigation? Just give us an update on that merchant mispricing issue yeah. too. Yeah. Okay. So, so let let me start with the with the reserve. Uh, so, um, and and the remediation uh, reserve that we put up. So the, they're unrelated. So the the um, merchant tiering reserve we booked 365 as a liability. You know that that is that has moved it is now about 370 million. Just as we've had some payments and. Uh, and uh, other flows in in through the um, uh, the uh, interchange that we had to correct manually for. So uh, the progress there in terms of discussions with our merchants is is positive. You, you know, we'll we don't have enough data points to make a material change to that reserve level yet, but uh, it's uh, it's progressing, my view, positively uh, through. Uh, through the end of the year and today as we speak. Now, uh, separately, uh, we we put up $80 million for a, uh, as we described it, a, a customer remediation reserve. Now, um, some context to that is, uh, is um, as part of this compliance journey, we've put in a significant number of resources to help us identify and correct issues. And as we prepare um, the business to continue to move forward to, to drive organic growth, we're, we're getting much, much better at identifying issues. And we identify an issue, what, what we've done here is if we think there's an op, there, there's a, it's appropriate to refund, um, refund customer payments, we're going to do that. So we, um, we identified uh, a particular issue largely within uh, servicing for our student loan business, although there, there was there was a tangential impact in another business line. We continue to look uh, across our business. Uh, but, uh, you know, the lion's share of that reserve relates to student loans. And, you know, essentially what we're, we're doing is is trying to position the business um, and that that at that product for successful exit. Thank you for taking my questions. I'll get back into you. Thank you. Our next question will come from Sanjay Sakrani with KBW. Thanks. Good morning. <clears throat> um, sorry, multi-part question on the same topic and then a follow-up. Um, can you update us, John, on the progress made with the regulatory agencies? I think that was sort of alluded to in the previous question. But, you know, maybe just the firmness around capital return post CCAR, what exactly happens um, to the CFPB consent order when the loan servicing is transferred? And then just curious, the, the loan growth expectations, was that any part driven by any regulatory related matters? Thanks. Yeah, this is John Owen. I'll take part of that and John Green will take the capital part. What I would tell you is over the last 18 months or so, we've made significant progress improving our risk management and compliance capabilities you know, we've increased our investments on risk and compliance in 2022 to 2023 up to about a $500 million level. And as John mentioned earlier, we think expense growth in that will be in the mid single digits in line with other guidance we've given. We've made improvements in the risk and compliance, but we still have uh, quite a bit of work to do. Uh, one thing I'd point out, the FDIC consent order, which we, we did get and was made public, uh, does not include the misclassification issue in that uh, scope of work. Uh, we're working closely with our regulators on that topic and really don't have 
anything further to add on that topic at this point in time. Okay. Uh, Sanjay, uh, I feel like your question is a is a five part question, but we'll, we'll do our we'll, we'll, sorry we'll, we'll, do, we'll do our best to answer it. So the loan growth um, aspect that you asked, um, it, it is completely unrelated to any regulatory issues. So so nothing nothing to connect on that point. In terms of uh, capital return, you know our, our commitments to um, capital return and capital allocation have not changed. So first to um, invest in profitable organic growth and second to return excess capital to shareholders. So as we um, as we kind of progress through the fourth quarter, we remained on pause with our, our buybacks. And um, given we've got a, a new CEO coming in, we are contending with you know a number of different compliance and risk management matters. We've got the merchant tiering reserve. We don't, we don't have any 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 feedback from our regulators on, on on that point. We decided that it'd be most appropriate to remain conservative in terms of our guidance related to buybacks. We um, we will go through CCARS as I said in my uh, prepared remarks. You know that'll form a view of capital under under significant stress as as it always does, and then we're going to have the exit um, or hopefully the exit from the student loan business, which will um, you know provide you know free up at least two billion dollars worth of capital. So uh, you know what what you're hearing here hopefully is is um, some indications that one we're, we're committed to returning excess capital to shareholders two that there will be uh, excess capital generated and available and three we're going to go through a diligent process um, internally share it with our board um, and then uh, take take the board's direction in terms of buybacks the consent order and uh, with the loan servicing like does that move? Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah, sorry, yeah, uh, yeah. That that was part five A, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, so that 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 um, remains in effect, um, and our uh, our children provider Nelnet is fully aware of the the consent order requirements in terms of uh, kind of servicing excellence, and you know they were chosen because they've got a track record in terms of being able to kind of service a portfolio such as this and. Uh, They've uh, dedicated both technology and resources to ensure a, a seamless transition. Okay. Then my follow-up just question is, uh, sorry, to my five-part question, is the reserve rate, Moshe sort of asked about it a little bit, but how should we think about that reserve rate pro yeah. migrating over the course of the year, given that the, the charge-off rate plateaus? Does the reserve rate start coming down, and where does it come down to? in a normal environment. I'm just trying to think about how we model that because that's really important. Yeah, yeah. Um, th thanks for that. We, we, were, we were hoping that that question would, would uh, come out. So the um, let, let me talk about the reserves for the quarter and then, then I'll give, give some perspective on uh, 24 and, and, and what could potentially happen there. So we, we drew receivables in the quarter $5.7 billion. Now, some of that was transactor balances that uh, are reserved light. But um, what, one thing that, that we've been consistent on uh, in terms of our communication is, is that as, as we approach peak losses, reserve levels increase. And what we've said previously is uh, typically we hit the highest reserve rate level one to two quarters before peak losses. So that's um, that's the path we're, we're on. Uh, let me provide some details on some assumptions that were used to, um, to set the reserve levels this year um, at year end. And then I'll give a perspective on uh, what we, what could happen in 2024. So, so macro is relatively benign. So unemployment levels, we ended the year at, at three, three seven. What we've assumed is um, an unemployment level of 4.2, so, so a mild increase. Household net worth, mild decrease.
savings rate, mild increase, and GDP to be uh, in 2024 to be about 1.3 percent. So, you know, relatively conservative, but not um, not overly optimistic set of um, of assumptions. Now, what um, what will come into play in 2024? is uh, obviously the macros, which will continue to be important, the portfolio performance. And by the way, it is it is tracking to our expectation with month-over-month month delinquency formation uh, declining. Um, the credit quality of the book remains relatively consistent with, um, you know, what we've done historically. So, um, you know, our expectation is that assuming the macros remain consistent, um, and uh, and the portfolio performance remains to our expectation that there will be some level of opportunity to reduce the reserve rate in 2024. Now, you know that's subject to a significant amount of governance, and we're gonna we're gonna make sure that we uh, you know comply with our internal processes and and generally accepted accounting principles. So, there are my caveats, but um, there, there's a lot to there's a lot of things that are different. Um, today than day one, so um, you know this, this step down will be um, uh, aligned with you know those points I just mentioned. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next question will come from Bill Carcacci with Wolf Research. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good morning, and thanks for taking my my questions, um, John. I wanted to follow up on your credit commentary. You know, given that it is such an, an important area of focus for investors, so you've been saying all along that you didn't move down the credit spectrum, uh, but the concern for many investors had been that you know other card issuers also experienced outsized growth as we emerged from COVID, and they had also experienced some normalization headwinds, but they were now starting to see delinquency form rate formation start to roll over as discovers DQ rate formations as recently as, you know, prior months um, data showed that, you know, your, your, your formations remain on an up and to the right trajectory. So I guess the question is, does the new disclosure on slide 14 confirm that your delinquency rate formations are indeed now also starting to roll over? And if so, you know, does that, really just reinforce your confidence that we could see peak NCOs hit in 2024 all else equal? Uh, yes, uh, and thanks for the question, Bill. So I, just to give you kind of the, the benefit of some data here, um, you know, from uh, September September through December this year, so the 30-plus the, um, delinquencies um, have declined month over month. So in uh, in September, we we peaked at a, an increase month over month of 26 bips. What what we said in the fourth quarter is we expected that to decline. Our October formation increased 20 bips, so it, so a relative decline to the prior month. November 15 bips, December 11 bips, and you know our expectation is that that um, that will you know, continue to decline. It, you know, where where it becomes negative, you know, we're not going to get into that because it'll be subject to a number of different things, including kind of our origination path and uh, and, and broad macros. So to, to get to the essence of your question, you know, we do have a level of confidence regarding kind of what's happening in the portfolio and the trend. And, um, you know, uh, as, as we progress in... 2024, you know, that'll be reflected in hopefully tightening guidance and then also tightening guidance to the lower end and then also um, hopefully um, reserve rate uh, changes. That's helpful. Thank you. And following up on your expense commentary, I believe you said that expenses uh, may need to increase further. Uh, potentially, maybe if you could frame, you know, the the, the possibility of there being, uh, you know, what, what you would view as another step function higher from here, uh, or you know, how, how should we think about the risk of further increase in expenses, and and how 
how how are we you know uh, how how should we think about your sustainable long term efficiency ratio uh you know i think as we look at historically discover has been very very much had you know lowest efficiency ratio in the industry um you know to what extent is that still something that we can expect okay yeah thanks thanks bill so you know our our expectation is that um the the long term efficiency ratio will be sub sub 40% so there there's still um there's still a view that 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 will happen you know the reason we put uh the the what I'll call is the caveat in in the, the 2024 expense guidance was you know a number of different institutions when they've been on this compliance and risk management journey have have not been able to call what um, what the actual compliance and risk management um, spend would be. You know, we had that remediation reserve in in the fourth quarter. You know, there were some indications that that we might have to put put something up for that, but you know, we didn't know. There's still some level of unknowns, unknowns, and you know, I wanted to make sure we're clear to you know the people listening to this call that that there is some level of risk to um, uh, to the expense guidance. Now, that said, you know, 5% on our expense base is a significant amount of dollars. You know, we feel like we have nearly a full complement of resources around uh, risk and compliance today, which is good news. Our issues management capabilities significantly improve. Our, uh, our path to um, improving overall governance is certainly on the right trajectory. So those factors give me confidence that we're not going to have a huge surprise. But, you know, maybe there could be. Just uh, We just don't have enough certainty given where we are on our compliance journey. Now, the rest of the cost base, um, you know, there's a couple things to, to keep in mind here. So right today, we have nearly 3,000 resources dedicated to risk and compliance um, management. A significant amount of those resources are dedicated to issues related to student loan servicing, which with a successful exit and transfer, it'll give us an opportunity to scrutinize the cost base in a different different way. So that's certainly on, on the, uh, the list of planned activities um, for the second quarter, third quarter, and then hopefully we begin some execution in the fourth quarter. So, you know, overall, you know, I feel I feel comfortable with with the expense guidance that that we've provided, and um, you know, we're gonna we're gonna do our best to make sure that you know every dollar we spend is is wise and that uh, the shareholders get the benefit um, from that. Very helpful. Thank you for taking my questions. You're welcome, Bill. Thanks. Thank you. Our next question will come from John Pancari with Evercore ISI. Good morning. Um, regarding the uh, the new eighty million dollar remediation charge, uh, did the did all of that remediation relate to the student loan business specifically? And was that in part tied also to the July 22 disclosure around the student loan issues that surfaced then? Um, and did any of that 80 million relate to the other business that you point that you mentioned that could have had a tangential impact? And what was that business? Thanks. Yeah. So um, uh, the 80 million was related to servicing issues. The lion's share of that. The significant share of that was related to student loans. Uh, there, there was um, a, a small amount that we put up um, related to personal loans. Upon reviewing that, um, there may be an opportunity to um, uh, release release that reserve. Very small, though. Um, the uh, eighty million dollars is not connected to the issues that we discussed in July. So, you know, what I tried to do is provide as much context as I could. So, um, we, you know, we've dedicated a number of resources to identifying issues to help us on this, on this consumer compliance journey. 
as as with any company, as you, you dedicate resources, they come up to speed, they are going to get more effective at identifying issues and correcting issues. This this is symptomatic of, of that, that progress. So, you know, we've got folks that are combing through every every single bit of our, our business to, to make sure we're we're executing, you know, consumer compliance at a high level. An issue was found. A uh, cross-functional team reviewed it, and we made an election that we were going to um, accrue something at year-end to, to cover potential remediation payments. Okay, and, and just related to that, um, does this um, so this is a newer issue versus what was discussed in July, and is it also newer versus what is in your existing consent order tied to student loans? Yeah, so um, you know what we you know what we disclosed in July was a, a, a broad program around um, risk and compliance management activities. This you know the specifics of the particular issues um, uh, weren't weren't discussed in any details. And you know what I've what I've shared with you right now is probably as much information as I, I'm going to share at this point. So, you, you know, the the takeaway should be is that you know we're you know we're progressing on the risk and compliance management activities. We're getting better at identifying issues. When we find an issue, we're gonna we're gonna deal with it. And you know, we we found an issue. We've put up a reserve for that issue, and you know we're gonna work through further details on it in order to ensure that um, you know consumer can. Consumer compliance is um, is where we want it to be. So uh, with that, um, I, I think I'll probably close this this, um, this particular uh, item out, if you don't mind. No, that's fine. Thank you for that. And my last thing was a very quick one on the loan growth guidance. You, you guided the average uh, balances for 24 up modestly. Can you help maybe quantify the up modestly? Uh, if you yeah. could, if you could maybe help frame it, thanks. Yeah, so uh, five to six percent on average. Okay, great. Thanks, John. Thank you. Our next question comes from Don Fandetti with Wells Fargo. John, um, you know it's good to see the delinquency formation showing some progress. Can you talk about later stage delinquency rates? I mean, they seem like they're still going up on a year-over-year -year basis. Or like, how are cure rates? I'm, I'm still trying to get my arms around this, like, potentially 5% NCO rate. It just seems high for Discover. Yeah. Um, yeah, the later stage buckets um, are kind of modestly improving. So we're, we're seeing improvements across every bucket. You know the 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 first bucket is is really the the key one, and then as you get into later and later buckets, the um, uh, the ability to cure just becomes more challenging because of the the, the situation that the consumer is in. But um, we are seeing kind of mild improvements there, so that that also is encouraging. Okay, and the 23 vintage. Can you talk a little bit about? what your early read is on that yeah um the net of it is is, is that it's early so um you, you know it, it's performing you know profitably and uh, you know we're going to continue to keep our eye on it so does that mean it's uh, it's not really trending that well relative to your expectations or is it kind of in line no no i, I didn't say that it uh, it's just it's early so um it's, it's performing generally um, in line with expectations. Okay, thanks. Thank you. We'll take our next question from Jeff Adelson with Morgan Stanley. Hi, thanks for taking my questions. Um, John, I just wanted to kind of follow up on the charge-off guide. I, I know you, you've mentioned that you know, you're hopeful this could come in at the low end, but could you could you maybe just dive into what would take us to the low versus the high end here. Um, and, you know, if this delinquency formation slowing continues throughout the year, is, is that 
kind of what's embedded in your expectation at, at getting at the low end here? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so, you know, our um, our baseline is that, that it's going to come in at the low end. Now, um, I shared the uh, the information in terms of the macros that um, uh, uh, that we use for reserves, pretty consistent in terms of uh, what we used for our, our what I'll say the second half view of, of charge offs. So, you know, what what could make that worse? Certainly, um, you know, a change to the macros, a you know some servicing issues, which highly unlikely, um, or um, you know, a, a miss in terms of forecasting. You know, I'm. I'm I'm comfortable, we're, you know, with our forecasting team. Uh, I'm comfortable with our servicing team, and we've got a number of programs, and we've dedicated uh, dedicated a lot of lot of lot of dollars in terms of analytics, in terms of call call frequency and and best time to call. And you know, we've worked on our our call scripts to ensure they're compliant, but also effective in terms of prioritizing payments. So you know, I feel. Um, Feel good about that. So you know the range just reflects um, a level of kind of broad uncertainty that we're going to tighten. Got it. And and just as my follow up, um, as I as we think about the NIM guide this year, I know you mentioned you're embedded in an expectation of four rate cuts. Um, if I think about where NIM exited the year, though, it it feels like um, the range of rate cuts using your your five basis points for every 25. It, it seems like there's there's more rate cut that embedded in there. Can you maybe just help us understand the drivers? Is um, there maybe a little bit more uh, interest to cool reversal going on, and and you know, maybe help us understand what you're assuming in positive betas on the way down? Um, is it is it going to be a little bit slower than what we've seen the last four rate cuts on the way up? Uh, yeah. So. So good, good question. So um, let me let me start off with 2023 and then the fourth quarter of 2023. So um, as a business, my view is great execution in terms of being able to kind of um, manage net interest margins. So year over year we were up. I think we're an outlier in that from that standpoint in uh, in financial services. You know what um, you know what we saw in in the uh, fourth quarter was, um, you know, cost of funding uh, increased as, uh, as lower rate CDs term out and higher rate CDs would come in. Our OSA rate, you know, remains competitive. Um, and, um, you know, the expectation on beta is that it'll be in the mid seventies and a declining rate. And, you know, I, I hope I hope that uh, the beta on the declining rate is higher. Also, um, something that's you know not baked into the into the elements of the guidance, but certainly, you know, with the exit of uh, student loans or the proposed exit from the student loan business, that that's going to throw a lot of liquidity back into the business. That'll give us an opportunity to be um, uh, slightly more. Um, aggressive in terms of deposit pricing, uh, you know that again that'll be a second half activity. So, you know the the four rate cuts that we put into um, into the baseline assumption, you know again two more than what we we had had forecasted in in December. You know it could be as many as six, which um, if it is, you know that'll certainly impact. Uh, um, Deposit betas and uh, uh, deposit pricing, and, and consequentially net interest margins. So, you, you know, the, the guide here I, I think is is appropriate, um, perhaps a, a little conservative. And our you know our baseline expectation is that we're going to deliver to the upper end of the uh, of the guidance range. Okay, thank you for taking my questions, John. Thank you. We'll take our next question from Terry Ma with Barclays. 
Hey, thanks. Good morning. Um, maybe just want to touch on the loan growth guide for 24 a little bit. Um, aside from the balance transfers and promos, um, how much control do you actually have on growth? Because going from 15% loan growth to 0% just seems like a hard pivot to me. So maybe can you just talk a little bit more about that? Then my second question is just what needs to happen before you can actually grow again? And is there a way to think about what that growth rate looks like as we um, look out toward 2025 and beyond? Thank you. Okay, thanks, Terry. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's important to take a look at the quarterly trends on, on loan growth um, versus the total total year because um, each quarter, um, what you you will see is that the, the amount of loan growth um, decreased quarter over quarter, and that that was partly due to payment rate, partly due to underwriting uh, standards, and partly due to uh, uh, kind of sales activity slowing as well. So um, in 2024, you know, we've guided to, uh, um, you know, loan growth to be flat. Again, payment rate 100 basis points higher than it was in 2019. That could be a positive if it, if it holds where, where it ended the year. You know, it's not going to um, impact loan, loan growth. So, um, you know, I, I feel like what we've tried to do here is put something on the table that's reasonable, that uh, doesn't uh, reflect, you know, a, a level of undue risk taking in a, in a uh, time where, you know, consumer behavior is actually uh, changing, you know, relatively dynamically. If you think back, you know, two and a half years ago coming out of the pandemic to, um kind of where where it is today and also the impact of inflation that uh hit um hit uh certainly all consumers but certainly you know in terms of our prime revolver uh consumers you know the lower uh the the lower third of those those consumers were impacted fairly significantly by inflation so we we do want to um kind of watch as i said previously Watch delinquency formations and uh, and our other um, our other metrics uh, before we um, press press on the gas on uh, on generating um, you know uh, a high level of new accounts in in 2024. Thanks. And is there a way to think about what growth would look like before um, when you re accelerate? Yeah, I would go back to kind of historical growth rates. Yeah, you know, the companies typically delivered, you know, somewhere between three, three and eight percent um, year over year growth. And then, you know, we feel uh, we feel like our um, underwriting and uh, credit and the, the opportunity to lend uh, profitably at a, at a rate higher than that, we will do that. So, what uh, you, you know, an important thing for you know our investors to remember is you know we we seek to generate you know high returns over the over the um, short mid and long term and you know that's that's essentially what uh, what this plan is is seeking to deliver. So Todd, right, I think you. we have time for uh, for one more, please. Thank you, sir. We'll go next to John Hecht with Jeffrey. Good morning, guys. Thanks for taking my question. And, you know, I, I know you've answered a lot on credit, so I, I apologize for one more. But, you're, you know, your 18 and 19 charge-off levels were in the low 3% range. And I, I think we, we've we all kind of said that was a, a good environment but a relatively normal environment. You're, you're guiding toward a high, you know, relatively higher, you know, closer to 5% charge-off rate this year despite low unemployment. I, I know you kind of called out the 2022 vintage is – something to think about there but maybe can you can you talk about the attribution of the different the difference in charge off rates between that period and now I, I, I think the kind of the reason for the question is just to give us some sort of level of understanding of, of where we are in the credit cycle and give us comfort that you know things will you know stabilize if not improve from here yeah um, yeah happy to John so um, a, a, a few points so, uh, you know, we're, we're in a significantly different environment today than we were back in, 
2018 and 19. So, you know, we're, we're coming off of uh, two years of abnormally low losses, so sub sub 2%. We had a, an incredibly high payment rate in, uh, in you know, going back two years ago. That is normalized. Um, what, what we're seeing is that consumers had significant amount of savings. Those savings levels have been depleted. You had a spending pattern with the consumers across the board that um, was, was uh, reflective, reflecting kind of pent-up demand. And uh, as savings rate came down, you know, that consumers needed to adjust their um, their spending patterns. Some did successfully, some did not. And then you're also seeing inflation, if you go back a year and a half to two years ago, inflation um, significantly outpacing wage growth. And that, that put certainly the the lower quartile of uh, of the consumers in in a significant amount of of stress um and and that's across across um all sectors of the economy so not 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 specifically to our prime revolver segment and uh on top of that you also had in 21 and 22 uh, two very large vintages and uh and so you know you put all those together what, what uh, naturally is going to happen is you're going to have charge-offs, um, what I'll say is peak, before they normalize back to uh, levels that, that you're accustomed to seeing from, from Discover. So, you know, my sense is that uh, given, given real wage growth, um, our, our consumers will end up in, a frankly, a better spot in 24 and 25 than they were in 22 and 23, and and you know our our charge off forecast and reserves reflect you know a view that um, you know the, the consumers will manage through this and you know delinquency formation will continue to slow. So um, anyway, uh, I hope that um, I hope that this this color is um, is helpful. Yeah, that, that's super helpful. And I'm, maybe could you give us a sense of uh, the charge-offs by product, or maybe like the is the mix going to be consistent with historical mixes, just to give us a sense, yeah, you know, from a modeling perspective. Yeah, the the only piece of information I'm going to give is uh, in the fourth quarter we expect student loan charge-offs to be significantly lower because okay, we're exiting. <laughs> thank you. All right. Well, I think we're going to conclude the call there. Thank you for joining us. I know there was a few of you still in queue who we didn't get to, but uh, feel free to reach out to uh, to the IRA team. We'll be around uh, all day and available to answer additional questions. Thanks for joining us, and have a great day. And this does conclude today's Discover Financial Services Earnings Conference call. You may disconnect your line at this time, and have a wonderful day. <laughs>